Welcome everyone to our online worship service for the second Sunday after Pentecost here at Swamp Lutheran. Thank you all for your faithful giving. Uh, it's important as it's a support for our ministries that on go and go on uh, right here in our community. Wanted to let everybody a little shout out. July 24th, uh, the Synod is hosting a boundless celebration at Nawakwa. It runs from 2 to 7. It is for our youth. I will be taking uh, folks from grades 6 through 12. So let me know if you're interested in attending. Um, there's no cost. Vacation Bible School is coming up in July, third week in July. We have a donation list on the table in the North X. If you are interested in donating something to support our ministry in that regard, uh, sign up in the Narthex or give us a call here at the office and we'll get you that list. Also, you'll notice in your bulletin, the Lutheran World Relief School Project donations are being accepted. So the details are in there. Take a look at that. We encourage your support. Hospitalizations and health concerns this week. Michael Wargo continues to wait for tests. We're operating under the no news is good news uh, theory there. Um, so we, we want to keep Michael in our prayers at this time as he awaits those results. Joan Reddig, uh, as I record this on Wednesday, is in the Lancaster Rehabilitation uh, Hospital down in Lancaster. Uh, but she expects to be released to come home this weekend. So we want to keep her in our prayers as well as Gary at this time uh, in hopeful expectation. Charlie Hopman remains at the Y Missing Health and Rehabilitation Center. He's having difficulty walking, and until he masters that, he'll be there. So we're hopeful uh, for his recovery at this time. I'm going to keep Charlie and Shirley in our prayers. Nettie Kreiner, in and out of the hospital this week. Pain, uh, and she's waiting for some test results. So I want to keep her in our prayers at this time as well. Birthdays this week. Sunday, Tom Henley. Tuesday, Guy Templin. Happy birthday, Guy. Wednesday, Vanessa Nauer, Zach Reiner, and Mae Van Zant. Thursday, June Everly and Troy Hagee. And then on Saturday, Faith Stoltzfus and Rachel Young. And now we begin our worship singing hymn number 848, Give to Our God Immortal Praise, verses 1 and 3. Mercy set us, in your mercy set us free from the chains that bind us and defend us from everything that is evil through Jesus Christ our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. Our first reading is from Isaiah the 65th chapter. The prophet announces God's impatience. The people's self-absorption is idolatry and images of practices that displease God fill this reading. Like a vintner who crushes the grape to release the wine, 
God will use Israel's exile to establish a new community of the faithful. The lesson reads, I was ready to be sought out by those who did not ask, to be found by those who did not seek me. I said, here I am, here I am, to a nation that did not call on my name. I held up my hands all day long to a rebellious people who walk in a way that is not good, following their own devices, a people who provoke me to, to my face continually, sacrificing in the gardens and offering incense on bricks, who sit inside tombs and spend the night in secret places, who eat swine's flesh with broth of abominable things in their vessels, who say, keep to yourself, do not come near me, for I am too holy for you. These are a smoke in my nostrils, a fire that burns all day long. See, it is written before me, I will not keep silent, but I will repay. I will indeed repay into their, into their laps their iniquities and their ancestors' iniquities together, says the Lord. Because they offered incense on the mountains and reviled me on the hills, I will measure into their laps full payment for their actions. Thus says the Lord, as the wine is found in the cluster, and they, and they say, do not destroy it, for there is a blessing in it. So I will do for my servants' sake and not destroy them all. I will bring forth descendants from Jacob and from Judah, inheritors of my mountains. My chosen shall inherit it, and my servants shall settle there. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second reading comes from the third chapter of Galatians. For Paul, baptism is a powerful bond that unites people not only with God, but with other believers. Those who call themselves children of God experience a transformation that removes prejudices of race, social class, or gender in favor of true unity in Christ. St. Paul writes, Now before faith came, we were imprisoned and guarded under the law until faith would be revealed. Therefore, the law was our disciplinarian until Christ came, so that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer subject to a disciplinarian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. As many of you as were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. There is no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male and female. For all of you are one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to Luke, the eighth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus' mission includes foreigners, and his authority extends to the casting out of demons. Some who witness Jesus' work are seized with confusion and fear, but the man who was healed is commissioned to give testimony to God's mercy and power. The Gospel speaks. Then Jesus and his disciples arrived at the country of the Gerasenes, which is opposite Galilee. As he stepped out on land, a man of the city who had demons met him. For a long time he had worn no clothes, and he did not live in a house but in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he fell down before him and shouted at the top of his voice, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you, do not torment me. For Jesus had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For many times it had seized him. He was kept under guard and bound with chains and shackles, but he would break the bonds and be driven by the demons into the wilds. Jesus then asked him, What is your name? He said, Legion, for many demons had entered him. They begged him not to order them back to go back into the abyss. Now there were on that hillside a large herd of swine was feeding, and the demons begged Jesus to let them enter these. So he gave them permission. Then the demons came out of the man and entered the swine, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and was drowned. When the swineherd saw what had happened, they ran off and told it in the city and in the country. Then people came out to see what had happened. And when they came to Jesus, they found the man from whom the demons had gone sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. 
and they were afraid. Those who had seen it told them how the one who had been possessed by demons had been healed. Then all the people of the surrounding country of the Gerasenes asked Jesus to leave them, for they were seized with great fear. So he got into the boat and returned. The man from whom the demons had gone begged that he might be with him, but Jesus sent him away, saying, Return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. So he went away, proclaiming throughout the city how much Jesus had done for him. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Please pray with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable and suitable in your sight. O God, our rock, our strength, and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. You know, I don't know about you, but I love a good story. And it seems that our gospel story today is a humdinger. It goes like this. He haunts the places of the dead. Every night the townspeople hear him shrieking among the tombs. When they're quick enough, they catch him. They wrap his wrists and ankles in chains and haul his naked body, securely shackled, back to town. But they can't contain the crazy. He escapes time and again, chains dragging behind him as he wanders the wilds, tearing at his skin until it bleeds trading one kind of pain for another. Whatever his name, nobody knows it. Whatever his past, nobody remembers it. But this homeless and troubled man becomes a key character in a story containing chatty demons, suicidal pigs, incredulous and scared townsfolk, and yes, Jesus, who delivers instantaneous healing and commissions the healed one to share their story of salvation. Put simply, our gospel lesson today is a bizarre and challenging one. Legion, he said, when Jesus asked for his name, for many demons had entered him. You know, a Roman legion contained 5,000 soldiers. And so this man who calls himself Legion, who was tortured in body, mind, and spirit, embodied the full range of human affliction and suffering. And so when we read this bizarre story, we are often tempted to debate the specifics. You know, do demons really exist? I mean, if this guy is really possessed by demons, or is he just mentally ill? And should we conflate acute psychological suffering with evil? If demons are real and evil, why is Jesus negotiating with them? Why did the pigs have to die? And wasn't Jesus concerned about the economic well-being of the swineherds and the townspeople? Many valuable questions here, folks, for sure. However, when we wrestle with them, they often distract us from connecting this story to our story. Instead, I think we ought to wrestle with the storyline to see where it intersects our own. For instance, if Jesus asks us our name, could we not also answer legion? I mean, aren't we just like this man, broken in so many ways, tormented at times by a multi-pronged assault on our mind, body, and soul? How often do the demons in our lives leave us feeling stripped of our agency, our dignity, our sanity, our community, rendering us anonymous, as they deprive us of our self-control and propel us toward self-destruction. Let's face it, what ails the human condition is legion. And we are all vulnerable to the evil that lurks all around us, haunting us as it seeks to take away our true names, torment us, and separate us from God and one another. You know, some of us are under the control of depression or anxiety, paralyzed and powerless. Some of us suffer illnesses at the intersection of medicine and culture, nature and nurture. Some of us labor under the chains of addiction, be it to sex or alcohol or other drugs. Maybe it's wealth, body or social image. 
Some of us are enslaved to the internet and social media. We're prone to bitterness, dishonesty, or in lust with our own rightness. Some of us are shackled to the painful memories of our past, the abuse and traumas we have experienced at the hands of others, be they strangers, loved ones, institutions, or systems of injustice. Some of us experience our skin colors, our accents, our genders, our sexualities as magnets for other people's hatred. And still some of us suffer under the cloud of fear, real or imagined, of the unknown, the misunderstood, the different, where our demons cause us to demonize another person or groups of people. If we are truly honest with ourselves, each of us could easily say, my name is Legion. We are all a mixture of genetics, geography, experiences, and personal choices, both good and bad, and God's providential care. We are as complex as we are broken. And too often we fail to understand all there is about ourselves, leaving us to confess just as Paul did to his readers in Rome, I do not understand what I do. What I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. And we often fail to know who and whose we are. And this leads us to push others, particularly God, away, just like the demoniac did. That is, he approached Jesus not to ask for help, but rather to push Jesus away. But Jesus asked him his name anyway. And in the process, returns him to his humanity, to his identity as a beloved child of God. And so it is with us, because our struggles, our demons be they emotional, mental, physical, or spiritual, are not our identity. They may possess us, but they are not who we are. And this is why our story in the gospel today is so powerful, because it shows us where salvation lies. It lies with surrendering to the one who alone has the power to cast out what torment. It lies in an encounter with Jesus that results in radical transformation that leads to healing and wholeness. You see, Jesus has the power to drive away all that conspires to keep us dead when God wants us to be alive. Fact is, there is no death-dealing agent in the world capable of withstanding the saving, healing, and resurrecting power of Jesus. But oh, how hard it is for us to live into this reality. To share it with all who pass through our doors here at Swamp and all those we meet along the path of our lives. Most often we find ourselves behaving like the townspeople who expressed no relief, no gratitude, no hospitality, no awe even upon seeing the man healed. You know, we humans... We seem to find a perverse comfort with the demons we know rather than embracing the freedoms that we don't. We seek out bad people so that we can feel good, shackling them, actually or metaphorically, to assuage our own insecurities, our hates, our fears. And you know, in the process, we too beg Jesus to go away. It seems that we often find the gospel to be just a little too disruptive, too offensive to our moral categories, our economic comforts, and our social norms. This resurrection life of unconditional love certainly is a kick in the pants sometimes so hard that we often ask Jesus to leave us alone, preferring to just stay dead and wallowing in our unhealed afflictions our grief, our loss, our doubt, our boredom. Living too much among the dead, dead ideas, things past, things decayed. Remaining in our state of numbness and disorientation instead of embracing a life of freedom and abundance in Christ. 
But you know, it need not be this way. When Jesus asks our name, it's an invitation to healing, renewal, and new life. We're invited to confess our brokenness, seeking his healing power in our lives. To learn from those we consider possessed whom Jesus has healed. After all, isn't it just like Jesus to choose the very people we consider the most unholy, the most unredeemable, the most repulsive, crazy, and unworthy? Heal them and then commission them to teach us the gospel, to teach us about resurrection in the here and now. A resurrection that sends us back to our own townspeople, just like the man in our story, to tell them of all that God has done for us. Folks, our story today is a story about ourselves, our problems and hopes, our truest names, a story about resistance and resurrection, a story about how Jesus finds us exposed and working among the tombs in our lives, scattering those demons and breaking the chains that bind us, clothing us in dignity and love, and then turning us into storytellers through our words and actions to help heal the world. Folks, this is our story. And I pray that our Lord leads us to live into it fully. Because that, my friends, is the good news in Christ Jesus for us today and every day. And so may the peace that surpasses our human understanding keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And let all God's people say, Amen. Amen. United in Christ and guided by the Spirit, we pray for the church, the creation, and all in need. Holy God, you hear the cries of those who seek you. Equip your church with evangelists to reveal the continuous call of your outstretched hands and your promises of a home in you. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. You hear the cries of the earth. Restore places where land, air, and waterways have been harmed. Guide us to develop and implement sources of energy and food production that do not destroy the earth. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. You hear the cries of those who are marginalized or cast out. On this Juneteenth observance, guide us continually toward the end of oppression in all its forms. Bring true freedom and human flourishing to all your beloved children. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. You hear the cries of those who suffer. Come to the aid of all who are homeless, naked, hungry, and sick especially those on our prayer list and all those we name before you now, either aloud on our lips or silently in our hearts. Bring peace to any experiencing mental illness that they can clearly recognize your loving presence. Lord, in your mercy, hear our, hear our prayer. prayer. You hear the cries of those who celebrate and those who grieve on this Father's Day. Nurture mutual love and tender care in all relationships. Comfort those for whom this day brings sadness or longing. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. We give thanks for the faithful departed whose lives proclaimed all you had done for them. At the last, unite us with them as we make our home in you. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. God of every time and place, in Jesus' name and filled with your Holy Spirit, we entrust these spoken prayers and those in our hearts into your holy keeping. Amen. Now let us pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, Father in heaven, heaven, hallowed be your name. Your, your kingdom, kingdom come, come, your will be done, done on earth as in heaven. heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And now receive God's blessing. 
God of peace, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you, comfort you, and show you the path of life this day and always. Amen. And now we conclude our worship today by singing hymn number 886, O oh, for a thousand tongues to sing, verses 1 and 6. Thanks be to God. Thank you.